One of the problems that students tend to have at the beginning of their research process is, is that of selecting a topic. And it's always a, a delicate process, I think, of negotiation, really, between the researcher and the people around them, including the potential research supervisor. And here I, I just want to set out a few notes for people who are having trouble in finding a topic for themselves. And there are a few guidelines, really, just to, as to what you might think about. First, let's try to locate what we mean by, by topic. Uh, we assume we're in a discipline, translation studies, interpreting studies, or whatever interdiscipline you feel is appropriate to your own work. Within that discipline, we'll have various fields. For example, within translation studies, we'll have a study of translation processes. We might have conference interpreting would be a field. Consecutive interpreting, note-taking might be a field. Uh, literary translation. Uh, localization, these will be fields within the discipline. Okay? It's within a field that we get the topic. The topic is, is not as broad as, for example, localization. Or the topic will not be literary translation. The topic might be uh, the impact of translation memory software on localization processes. That would be a topic, rather more specific. Or it might be literary translations from Spanish into English in the 19th century. That would be a topic. Okay, So it, it, it's a field with specifications as to what kind of data you're going to look at. A topic is not necessarily a title. When you specify your topic, uh, it doesn't mean you don't have to give a, a, a snazzy title. Um, for example, uh, yeah, I, I worked on 12th century translations in Spain, or the, the School of Toledo. I, I published that, uh, I think the chapter heading was Toledo and all that, okay, um, which refers back to 1066 and all that uh, in British history. Uh, no, the topic should just be a neutral noun phrase describing the area you're going to work on. Save the title for the marketing. That comes later. At a lower level than the topic, you get into modeling and then the formulation development of hypotheses. They become more and more specific within your topic. Okay, so if you look at that, you can see here we're talking about a kind of mid-level uh, in the process. The process of developed research and here deciding what you're going to work on. A good topic should have at least these. First, it should not have been done to some extent. Uh, you can work on a field where people have researched before. For example, when I did my research on the 12th century, uh, I found that a lot had been done. Happ happily so, because I have trouble reading any of those 12th century texts. I had to find good contemporary editions. Uh, so it had been done in a way, but it hadn't been done in the way I wanted to do it. Uh, I was setting out to apply negotiation theory to relations between Christian and Arabic cultures in Hispania in the 12th century. Uh, so it was rather more specific. It's okay to go into a field where lots of work has been done and to develop a new topic or a new approach within that field. It can be quite economical in some cases as well. You don't waste a lot of time doing work that other people have already done. A topic should then be selected in such a way that not everything is already known about it. A topic should be able to discover something. Okay, It shouldn't be obvious. Uh, when I set out doing that particular project, I didn't know what I was going to find but I, I had reasons to believe that other researchers had not found these answers to the questions I had. Okay, so you, you must look for this new edge. Not virgin territory, but the capacity to discover, uh, découvrir, uncover, reveal something that is not obvious. 
continuing in that line, the topic should allow for discoveries of things that are in some way important. Um, what do we mean by important here? Uh, I, I take the idea from Bourdieu where he says uh, that his sociology, his whole discipline, aimed to be uh, une science qui dérange, a science that upsets. Uh, and, and his aim was to make people question their ideas about society. Okay, that's one kind of importance. If something is important, it makes people question their presuppositions. Um, but importance could also be something that if true, if we discover something and it has effects on many other things, then we can say it's of more importance. Um, okay, for example, let's continue with the Toledo example. Um, one of the researchers, Marie-Thérèse d'Alveni, a French researcher, found something like 43 manuscripts of the one translation done in 12th century Toledo. Uh, the manuscripts are all, all over Europe and it took her years of work in archives. And she found that a comma had been displaced in the uh, apparently authoritative edition. And you say, well, so what? You know, all that work and you find the commas displaced and, and a genitive was, was uh, misinterpreted. Uh, by some copyists. Uh, and she argued on the basis of this that the translator was not one person, it was in fact another person. Okay, so what? You get to say, you know, all these philologists go around spending years doing this stuff, and so what? Uh, but then she managed to demonstrate, for me, fairly convincingly, that the real translator had been a Jewish intermediary and that the copyist tradition and subsequent traditions concerning the school of Toledo had completely suppressed this Jewish role, this Jewish intermediary role between the Christian and Arabic cultures. Ah, and that's where it becomes not just interesting but also important. If we can find more traces of such repression then we start to reinterpret the entire topic and beyond that, the general field of uh, cross-cultural relations in Hispania. So the, those comma and the interpreted, misinterpreted gen genitive uh, might seem minor in themselves, but they become important when they affect other things in the world. A good topic is one that has that potential. A topic should be something that can be done. It's no good setting out to say, well, I want to do something similar. I'm going to have to locate 50 manuscripts of this other translation from the 12th century. And then you'd find that there are only three readily available. And you haven't got funds to travel around Europe to go to all the libraries anyway. And you haven't got time to do it. Nobody's going to give you access. Um, no. Uh, in the process of topic selection, you have to be reasonable about what you can do. Do not say well, just what you would like to do. You have to check and see if books, manuscripts, the source materials are available. Say, oh, I'm going to do a questionnaire of 300 conference interpreters. No, you're not. They're not going to reply to your questionnaire. Not 300 of them anyway. Um, you check that before going into the definition of your topic. Here are some examples. I'll just give you examples of topics that I've worked on because topics are a personal thing. Translation flows between France and Germany in the late 19th century. Okay, that sounds as boring as hell. Uh, but after I'd worked on that for a year, I came to believe that there was a moment in 1892-1893 when France and Germany were moving together in a movement of Entente and that the European Union could have been formed in the 1890s. And it wasn't because of certain translations, French translations of German texts. Okay, uh, I didn't know that at the beginning, but I suspected that um, I, I, I was looking around for a topic where relations between countries were bad because of a war, then very good as they were at the beginning of the 1890s, and then bad as they went towards 
the First World War. Uh, and I was interested in the role of translations in changing relations between cultures. So I selected a topic where there was obvious change. School of Toledo topic because I thought there had been some uh, repressive movement within traditional European histories of that period, not just Spanish, European. In fact, the, the main repression was by a French historian. Uh, third topic, this is the one that uh, occupies my mind at the moment, the impact of new translation technologies. Uh, why is it important? Well, anybody who's worked in the field knows that they're great because productivity is increased enormous, enormously. Um, we can uh, translate, localize into many more cultures, many more languages than we could previously. And at the same time, the kind of work it creates for translators is boring donkey work. There's good and bad. I think we can help to improve the technology, so it's a topic that really does interest me a lot. When you go into topics in these terms, you have to think about who the stakeholders are. Stakeholders just means people who have an interest in getting some benefit out of a project. Now, the stakeholders in any research topic are going to be the obvious ones. First, your readers. You're going to do the research, publish the results as a set of articles or in a book form in our field, and your readers are going to expect to get something out of it. So you have to think about them at the beginning. What am I going to tell them that they don't already know? Why are they going to be interested in it? Why is it going to be important for them? Who are my readers? The topic also has to address the interests of clients. might sound strange here, but uh, most research projects these days do have funding agencies. We get money for research. And these are our clients. We have to give these people stuff for their money. We have to give them a certain amount of publications. We have to see their name mentioned on the publications. We also have to sell our research projects to the clients. We have to tell them why it's important and what benefits it's going to produce for them and the people they represent. Uh, they're usually governments or ministerial agencies. So you have to think about your topic at the beginning as something you're going to sell to your client. The topic usually has to concern the institutions we work in. Uh, the topic, a good topic for the university I'm speaking from now, let's face it, would be something that attracts local press. They want researchers to be in the newspapers so that people in this province uh, will be aware that research actually happens at this university. All right, we have to recognize that. They have a right to that. Let's try to do something that they will be interested in, if we can. Beyond that, you might look at the institution as being a local one within a system of universities here within Spain, which is funded by the Spanish state, which represents the Spanish people and their cultures and society. And we might say, well, look, my research may not get local press, but the results will be in some way beneficial for the society that is funding me. And you have to think on that level, I think, even at the beginning. Stakeholders also include the people who are going to put up with you. If you're going to do research, you're going to be pretty antisocial, hard to be with, for how long? Three to five years? Your family and friends are also st stakeholders. Uh, if they're going to put up with you and allow you to do this, to go to the library, to spend the time, and to you to spend your sleepless nights or whatever, try to think about doing something that is beneficial for them. Why not? They are, after all, the most immediate representatives of your society. Finally, no, not finally, think about your subjects. Uh, subjects, I mean the people you're working on. If we're working on translation or interpreting, we're usually working on other human beings, translators, interpreters, or their work, indirectly on them. We have to think about doing something that's going to be in some way beneficial for them as well. 
perhaps these days beneficial for the translation profession and the process of professionalization. I think these are, are key terms when we think about uh, a topic. Uh, the, my, my interest in the new technologies has a lot to do with the professionalization process. Finally, you are also a stakeholder. Your topic has to make sense to you and be important to you. Not just on paper as something you're going to sell to all these other stakeholders, you've got to feel it within and be motivated by it. You really want to work on this topic for one reason or another. The reason is your affair. Uh, but recognize that you have a right to inner motivation and select a topic that corresponds to that. If you haven't got it, don't do it. That's why your supervisor should not just give you a topic. The topic has to be yours. It has to be something you want to work on. It has to come from you. That's about all I want to say. I, I just add a final note uh, which goes from there more into the questions of ethics, ethics of research, but they, they, they should be thought about at the beginning as well. Uh, this is the relations to subjects. Um, if people help us in our research, if they give us translations, if they answer questionnaires, go through interviews, and there are many kinds of research we can, uh, we can, we can uh, embark upon, uh, how do we relate to them? I think it's the same question as to all the other stakeholders, but, but in the case of translation and interpreting, which are professions that do suffer marginalization to some extent, I think the question is of particular importance. How do we relate to them? Here, here are some basic principles. First, respect. If you're working on the work of somebody else, respect that person. Okay, you find a translation that has a thousand mistakes and they didn't know the language or they weren't paid properly or whatever. Your topic can't be all the mistakes I found in this, this really laughable translation. Uh, your topic has to be why the mistakes were there. Oh, why there wasn't enough respect for this translator. Why were they given a job they were not prepared to do? Uh, why were they not paid enough? Why didn't they have enough time? And so on. Respect the person and, and write that into your topic. One step beyond respect would be what's called advocacy, where you start arguing, perhaps like a lawyer on behalf of a client. Uh, you argue their case, argue their cause. Here we have a profession which needs more social recognition. I'm going to do research that helps them get more social recognition. Even if uh, you're only helping them by creating more space in the academy, uh, that's a, a respectable justification of your topic. Uh, advocacy should mean arguing on behalf of the people you're working with. Certainly not against them. If you're arguing against them, work with somebody else or work with other material. Powerful idea that, that's again from Bourdieu. Uh, within the notion of advocacy, uh, Bourdieu, in some of his work, especially on, on poverty, in France, um, gave lots of space to interviews so that the poor, who are the people who ha don't have access to a public voice within the society, could in some way speak through sociology. And sociology as an academic discipline could be a mouthpiece for people who otherwise do not have voices. That's an interesting idea because translators and interpreters, when they're translating and interpreting, do not have voices. Their, their voices are lent to other people, to their authors or their, their prime speakers. Um, research might be a way in which we can give people voices they don't otherwise have. Beyond that, uh, and a, a word of the, the 1990s now, would be empowerment. Our research can give people more power than they otherwise have. Power through knowledge. Uh, perhaps our research or the choice of a topic should be something that creates knowledge that we keep not just for us and our institutions or our clients, but we make available 
to the very people who have helped us get it, to the translators and the interpreters, the professions around us. And thereby, we help them empower themselves. To sum up what I'm saying there, uh, the last thing, empowerment, leads on to action research, and there'll be another talk about action research somewhere around here. When formulating your topic, you have to not just write a neat noun phrase, you have to think about all the justifications for it, reasons why this topic should be done, this research should be done. And I think the key here is that we have to work on two levels. We have to justify it on the widest level. That is, it's going to improve human the destiny of humanity or something like that, or it's going to be good for our societies, it's going to be good for cross-cultural relations, it's going to be good for multiculturalism within our country, whatever is appropriate to where you are. And you must think on that level. But also, particularly in the case of translation and interpreting, we must be prepared to speak on a very local level. Don't denigrate the local press. Don't denigrate uh, the chance to go along and present your research to the local translators association or to put it on the web in a form that they can read, not just in academic scientific prose, uh, but publish in magazines, in, in, in the professional journals, uh, in a way that is accessible to people. In a way, the, the selection of a topic should allow for both those levels and everything in between. You have to think about the whole lot before you do it. Of course, we're only talking about the starting point. You, it'll all change as you go along. Topics will change as you go along as well. But I would really suggest that, that if you put a lot of conceptual work into getting the topic right at the beginning, then it should be a point of discipline. You should be very, very reluctant to change it. You've got the topic, that's a topic, you keep it going for as long as you really have to, until, well, sometimes we fall in love with other people, sometimes we fall in love with new topics. It does happen and can happen. In the meantime, though, it would be enough if you fell in love with just one topic to get started. <laughs>